Thank you, worship team. <clears throat> I, uh, I am a bit of a conundrum. Many of the things that I get very excited about don't actually go together at all. Uh, for example, I love going to the symphony, uh, but I also get very excited about attending a rock concert. I, I like to stay in a fancy hotel with a spa-like feel. But I also really love camping on an uninhabited island in the boreal forest up north, 100 kilometers from everywhere, and sleeping out under the stars. I love hockey and baseball, but I almost never watch a complete game on television. I enjoy self-propelled things like cycling, like hiking, kayaking, and canoeing, but I am also a total fan of almost anything with a high-powered engine attached to it. I, I have driven a racing go-kart on a track at over 150 kilometers per hour. I've operated a car on public roads at over 200 kilometers per hour. I'm not sure I should be telling you this. I've launched a car into the air, actually, uh, also on a public road, um, and flown a distance of nearly 30 meters. Uh, and I've also done a wheelie on a street motorcycle, also on a public road. And yet I normally drive all of my vehicles within just a few kilometers of the posted speed limit. I am a self-proclaimed car guy, and yet I have never owned a hot rod, a tuner car, or an exotic of any kind. Every vehicle I've ever owned has been relatively plain and bone stock. I tend to know a fair amount about 
hot rods and tuner cars and exotics, but I rarely enjoy the thrill of actually experiencing them. My knowledge is mostly just theory. But one time in particular, I had a chance to fulfill a dream, kind of a, a bucket list type of thing that I thought I'd never be able to do and to experience. It was June the 30th of 2017, just after lunch, and I got the chance to actually get behind the wheel of a Ferrari and drive it. Actually, uh, that exact Ferrari in the picture up on the screen, uh, that's the one that I drove. And I have to tell you, simply knowing the facts about that Ferrari, and I knew quite a lot of facts about it, the difference between that and actually experiencing that Ferrari are two radically different things. Now, for those of you that know me, even just a little, the fact that I often talk about cars and use examples about cars comes as no surprise to you. Most often when I speak, the subject of cars comes up, and I often draw parallels between cars and the other things that I'm speaking about. In fact, this message was originally titled, Where the Rubber Hits the Road, but I changed it to beyond theory after working on it some. <clears throat> the theme of this current sermon series is, so what? So what? And the topic we've been exploring over the past number of weeks is the Holy Spirit. It got me to thinking, how often do we approach the Holy Spirit as just theory? How often do we hear a sermon or read a book or a portion of a book dealing with the Holy Spirit and think, oh yeah, that's great, that's good food for thought, and yet it, we never go any further than that. We never take it any further than just thinking about it. Well, I'm, reason, I'm a reasonably practical guy, and I want, to, I want us to have our experience with the Holy Spirit to go just beyond the theory. I want us to be more practical, right? Where does the rubber hit the road? How is the Holy Spirit manifested in our own lives and our experience? And if you're thinking right now, oh great, he's going to talk about speaking in tongues or prophecy or laying on of hands, for healing or being slain in the spirit, well, just relax. While those things are often legitimate and they, are ab they absolutely have their place within the Christian community, I won't be talking about those particular things this morning. I want to talk about the ways that the Holy Spirit works in our lives on a much less spectacular level. But yet, in ways that should be should be regular occurrences for those that are paying attention to the Holy Spirit. Now, I know that you're tuning into this uh, from your homes. You may be sitting all cozy on your couch with your breakfast maybe still in your hand. Uh, certainly a cup of coffee. I know I would be. Maybe you're still in your pajamas. You may be barely awake right now, but don't nod off or fall asleep on me now. I want you to pay close attention. These next 20 minutes can literally change your life. I know that's a bold statement. But this is that important. This is beyond theory. This is where the rubber hits the road, and I don't want you to miss it. I want to read three short passages of Scripture this morning, and after each tell you a short story that I hope drives the point home about what the passage is speaking of. Each of the stories are from my own experiences. They're short testimonies, kind of. And I don't tell them to boast about my perceived supreme attentiveness to the Holy Spirit's working in my life. Mm -mm. Rather, uh, I tell them I tell them as a way of encouraging you to listen more attentively uh, and recognize more fully 
how the Spirit might be speaking to you. The first passage is found in John chapter 16, verses 7 to 8. Jesus is speaking here, and he says, But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. So the advocate that Jesus refers to here in these verses is the Holy Spirit. And he says that one of the roles of this advocate who is coming is to convict. In 1996, when my wife and I were both uh, youth leaders at another church, uh, we were part of a leadership team that took our young people on a service trip to Simon House Bible Camp, about eight hours north of here. A number of, of northern churches had gathered at the camp for an annual weekend of family time and joined services. And the church I was a part of had volunteered the youth group to go up there and run a program for the kids while the adults had their teaching time. Now, both kids and adults uh, were, were gathered together uh, for the singing and I remember being rather less than impressed by the music that first evening. In my head, I was thinking, my goodness, this is terrible. The timing is off. Hardly anyone seems to be on pitch. This is a hot mess. Well, that night, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and convicted me of my bad attitude. Not in, an, not in audible words. But he said to me, how dare you? How dare you complain about what you just participated in? These people love me. They are pouring out their hearts and their voices to me in pure, uninhibited praise. And all you can do is be critical of how it sounds to you. You need to focus on how heartfelt praise sounds to me. That night as I prayed, I asked for forgiveness of my foul attitude. And I asked for a change of perspective. The next evening as these churches joined again to sing praises to God, I prayed again for the Spirit to help me to hear what He hears. You know what? That night was some of the most wonderfully beautiful music I've ever heard in my life. Why? Why is that? Had they all learned to sing better as they had slept on the, the previous night? No. But God, through his Holy Spirit, had dealt with my arrogance and my attitude had been changed. I needed convicting, and the Holy Spirit convicted me. And it changed everything. It changed absolutely everything. One of the roles of this advocate who is coming is to convict. Now, our second passage is Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 28. It says this. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly awaiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. That statement, Simeon was there. Not because he was clairvoyant and knew the future, not because he never left the place. No, he was there because the Holy Spirit led him and Simeon was paying attention. In 2007, while I was pastoring in Flin Flon, Manitoba, I was also 
the chaplain of uh, the Flin Flon Junior Bombers. That's the major junior hockey team in town. They're a part of the Saskatchewan Junior Hockey League, and the players are typically aged 18 through 20. Well, one day, as I was making my way home for lunch after an appointment near the arena, I felt this overwhelming tug to go up to the rink and say hi to the players who would just be wrapping up their practice for the day. I fought it a bit, actually, thinking, wouldn't it be strange for me to just pop in unannounced with no real reason for going there? I mean, lunch would be ready for me, actually, when I got home. I'd be able to see my kids as they would be home from school for lunch, and, and it just didn't make any sense for me to miss that for what seemed like a, a, a passing feeling. But I just could not ignore the nudging that I was sensing that I should stop in. And so I wheeled the vehicle around, pulled into the parking lot of the Whitney Forum, and walked through the doors. I made my way down to ice level, and the guys were just leaving the ice and heading to the dressing room. One of the players saw me standing there, and his eyes went as big as saucers. Hey, Scott, wow, this is weird that you're here, but I need to talk to you. Okay, I said, let's talk. He then proceeded to pepper me with questions about the mistakes that we make, and does God really forgive everything? He felt that some of what he had done was just far too awful, and that he was sure God couldn't forgive him for that. I was able to share with him 1 John 1 verse 9, which says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. All wickedness, not just some of it. That young man received God's forgiveness that day. And the only reason, the only reason it happened was because the Holy Spirit led me to the hockey rink when it made no sense for me to go there. If we can learn to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit and then to be obedient to that leading, we can be used in amazing ways for the work of God's kingdom and for the spreading of the gospel. And you don't need some superhuman power or some crazy... You don't need anything extra special to do it. You just need to pay attention. The Holy Spirit leads us. And if we are listening, we'll recognize it. The last passage I want us to consider this morning is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Jesus is present in the church by his Spirit, and the gifts given to the church come to the church through the indwelling of the Spirit. And we are told here that these gifts are given to equip God's people to do his work. See, the Holy Spirit equips us to do the work of building up the body of believers and to reach the world with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, when we were up north and we had a, a new couple start coming to our little church, they had two children, close in ages actually, to our own two kids, and they decided to check out the church because their kids had begun to ask questions about life that they could not answer. Questions like, if God is good and loving, then why do so many people suffer? Or, 
What are we here for and what happens when we die? These are not small questions. This couple figured a church should have those answers. Now, one of the first few sermons that I preached when they started coming was part of a series that I was working through. And I had planned uh, this series long in advance, actually. In fact, this was one of very few sermons that had completely fleshed out weeks before. It was completely ready to go weeks before I had actually preached it, maybe a month or more. And at the end of the service, the woman of this couple came up to me and she said, I have a question for you and I need you to be 100% honest with me. Okay, I said, I always try to be completely honest. Then she said, when you preach a sermon, do you have specific people in mind? Like, do you aim your message at one certain person in the church? Ooh. I told her that the way I prepare a message or a sermon series is to start with prayer and ask the Lord what it is he wants me to say. Once I know what I'm supposed to say, I pray that the Holy Spirit would guide me to speak in such a way as to reach into the lives of those who will hear it so they will receive exactly what God knows they need to hear. But I'm not trying to preach to one particular person. Wow, she said. It seemed as though you were speaking straight at me and saying things that I had to hear. I then told her that the incredible part is that I had prepared and written that entire message before I had ever even met her. When we are attentive to the Holy Spirit, he will equip us to do his work and to build up the church. This is where the rubber hits the road. The Holy Spirit and his work in our lives needs to go beyond theory. We can't be satisfied only to talk about the Holy Spirit. We need to learn how to live in the Spirit, to walk in step with the Spirit, to pay attention to the Spirit, and to act in obedience to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, that advocate that Christ sent is alive and well and living in Winnipeg and at Portage Avenue Church, I believe. Let's not fall asleep, but let's pay attention. Let's be alert. Let's live beyond theory in the power of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. As we close our time here this morning, I want to tell you something. And it's something that we express here each and every Sunday, each and every week here at Portage Avenue Church. But we want you to know this because we believe it to be so entirely life transforming. And it's this, God loves you. God loves you. It's why Jesus came and paid such a huge price to wipe away your sin. It's why Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us, because he loves you. And he wants you to know him. He wants you to be in relationship with him. And so if your hearts have been stirred here this morning, if your curiosity has been piqued, if you would like to know more about God, his son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, and what we've been talking about here this morning, we would be happy to share with you our lives and our relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. For those of you viewing this on live stream, our information is on the screen. And so let me encourage you to be in contact with me, with Pastor Jedediah, or Pastor Jennifer, or with any of the staff here. We would love 
the opportunity to talk with you more about a relationship with Jesus. And now may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Until next Sunday. Bye for now. God bless you this week. Thank you.